This is a production of PBS Charlotte. This week on Off the Record, police investigate Charlotte's first homicide of this year as City Council looks for ways to avoid a repeat of what happened last year. Meanwhile, UNC Charlotte plans a permanent memorial to the victims of last year's on-campus shooting. A new owner and new plans for an old affordable housing project in Charlotte that's uh, been in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. Charlotte's airport makes the top five in on-time performance, but is CLT getting better or are the other major airports getting worse? And David Tepper picks a college coach for the Panthers. Plus, let's mosey on down to the old scooter corral and our off-the-record question of the week, all next on PBS Charlotte. Hi, I'm Jeff Sonier. This is Off the Record, where we talk about the stories you've been talking about this week. And if you watch the news, read the news, and listen to the news, well, you'll recognize the names and faces around our table. Dedrick Russell from WBTV and Mark Becker from WSOC-TV, thanks for joining us. Also, Eli Portillo from the UNC Charlotte Urban Institute and Ashley Fay from the Charlotte Business Journal. Thank you for being here. Thanks also for joining us at home. You can uh, join the conversation. Just email your questions and comments to off the record at WTVI.org and welcome to our Facebook Live audience. You can comment, you can like us, you can share our Facebook posts. We're just glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us. Well, uh, by the way, thanks for coming back. <laughs> We're here. I've been gone for a while. Happy New Year. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, um, you know, we kind of pick up where we left off from uh, 2019, talking a little bit about uh, the violent crime in Charlotte. Uh, every year starts with homicide number one, and that's where we are right now. But again, uh, city council looking at ways to, you know, keep us from getting close to the record we almost set last year, the kind of record that a city never wants to set. I know Mark and you've been kind of, you know, that you follow yeah. these things from crime scene to courtroom. Yeah, you know, and, and I let me start here. I, I think city council by and large, and jump in if I'm wrong, was pretty silent on all of this last right. year, right? They we had an election and really wasn't an issue that was front and center. Maybe it should have been. Well, now they have, with the police department, identified using data some hot spots, four hot spots in the city, uh, one on the west side, north side, south side, and east side, uh, where crime, 8% of the, of, the, of the violent crime happened in only two square miles collectively, right? That's a very s small area. Um, and, and they're now going to focus on those holistically, looking at not just policing, but other factors leading to crime. Uh, I got a text from somebody saying, what well, took so long you know, uh, to, to, to do that? But um, I went out and talked to people in some of those neighborhoods. Nobody was surprised. These are areas that have been known trouble spots probably for 20 years, with maybe a little bit of shifting involved there. For the most part, though, there was nothing new in that. I think what everybody's hoping is that this will be a new approach, a more holistic approach. Let's talk about housing problems. Let's talk about uh, so the mental health was what some people brought up in issues with people on the streets with mental health issues. Of course, it's far more complex than that, but it, it, it's a start and, and city council now, you know, overseeing this and the police department, you know, really deferring to city council and city leaders on this one. I tried to talk to them about it. But it's, it, we'll see where it goes. So far, knock on wood, as we sit here right now, only one homicide this year. That's better than we were last year. Yeah. Does it surprise you that the police are kind of in the background on this? I mean, that was, that was kind of what I thought was remarkable about the meeting was that they talked so little about policing in, in what has traditionally been you know, a police matter. A little bit. And the police department was very deferential to, to, to uh, city council on this and to uh, the, the city uh, researcher who came up with the, the, the data and collated the data and all of that. Um, so they really are deferring and saying this is a bigger issue than just us. Um, it, it did surprise me a little bit that they were a little less involved. I tried to get out with some of the police out on the street. Uh, the day after the report was released, and I was told, yeah, we're really not going to do that. Hmm. Uh, so we went out and talked to people in the neighborhood. We talked to 
our old friend Malcolm Graham, who was on city council years ago and is back and is actually uh, mm. representing one of those areas on Beatty's Ford and LaSalle where, where some, of those, some of those issues were. But everybody we spoke with said, look, it's gonna take more than police to solve this. Absolutely, it's gonna take everybody. It's a step in the right direction, but then some people were saying that, um, that do you perpetuate the sense of false sense of false security that you know you you highlight these areas mm -hmm. then are you saying that okay that I'm not going to live in those areas and I'm going to go to the south side to balance it's more safer to live there and you know and they continue stereotypes and things yeah. like that and I get it you have to map where the crime is but then just putting that out does that you know give a false sense of security for some people and does it stigmatize it those areas exactly exactly and then you know you know wraparound services we always hear that mental health you know the, these are the issues that we have been talking about for years and years and years and still nothing well, and I don't know if, um, if, if if they can be able to solve that because if you could solve that then you can make sure that every third grader will be able to hmm. read <laughs> by yeah. third grade you know what I mean so I don't know it, as you said it's a bigger problem and I don't know right. it, is there a solution for there and one thing I was talking to one city council member they were saying one thing that was was not mentioned that could have been mentioned is better parenting skills you know that I know if we had that better parenting skills that that all comes in together on how to make sure that we have better outcomes for our young people well I think there are a few things worth mentioning about this new uh, city approach to um, violent crime they're going to be working with the county and other agencies they were very clear that uh, they're going to start collaborating and have some high-level meetings between the mayor, chair of the county commission, um, the managers of the city and county to try to find some ways to work together. But in these hot spots uh, that they identified, I believe there were 14 homicides out of uh, 108 mm -hmm. last year. So even if you got those to zero, we still would have been mm -hmm. near a record last year um, with almost 100 homicides. So I think this is a bigger and more diffuse problem um, than in these hot spots. And, um, you know, to your point, I believe um, Julie Iselt, the mayor pro tem, said this feels a little like Groundhog Day. We've talked about <laughs> the need to have mm -hmm. um, right. wraparound services, mm -hmm. to have better services for youth, mental health, uh, drug addiction. Um, you know, there wasn't anything necessarily that we haven't heard before. Uh, and then you get to the tension of these are things that take a really long time right. to implement. Some of them might take years and more funding. Mm -hmm. If we've got a homicide crisis that we need to yeah. address now, um, how do you square those two? You've got a fire in the kitchen. You've got to put the fire out first and, and all of that other stuff. And talking about how you're going to rebuild the kitchen maybe, but we've got to you know, put the fire out. That's where policing gets involved. And let me tell you, I was in court yesterday uh, for something we call homicide day when homicide cases are, yeah. are, are uh, a lot of times dealt with in plea deals, and there was a bond hearing for one of the young men who was charged with uh, killing that, that young woman who was on her way to nursing school, Kendra right. Crank, almost a year ago. And I saw some of the change there where this young man, according to his attorney, was in the back seat, didn't have a gun, some question about that, but didn't actually you know, do anything with the shooting. And uh, his attorney asked for a bond, and the judge said, no bond. And Everybody else who asked for a bond that day, no bond. Hmm. And afterwards, the parents of this young woman who was killed said, you know, we need to let these young people know that it isn't a revolving door in Mecklenburg County. So the, on several fronts that, you know, the, the issue is being addressed, and I suspect we'll see a lot more of that. Yeah, by the way, the statistics that City Council looked at I thought might be worth sharing. Um, 2019 homicides, 108 compared to 56 in 2000. 18. 25% of the homicides in the last two years stem from arguments, revenge, disputes. 20% of them are domestic uh, cases. 90% um, of the suspects are male. 25% of the suspects are former felons, people who have committed serious crimes in the past. And 60% of the victims are African American. Those durable hotspots, that's what they call those high crime areas that, again, only resulted in about 14 of those 108. Um, Homicides, you know, it comes back to the thing we've talked about before, the tipping point, whether it's one event like a CEO being killed on the streets in uptown or uh, homicides happening in neighborhoods where they don't typically occur. I mean, you know, the, the, one, the one homicide we have this year, his name was Devon Lamont Smith. He was killed at 3 a.m. off of Beatty's Ford Road. He staggered into a stranger's house, collapsed on the floor and died. Police still haven't made an arrest as of the taping of this show. I mean, you know, we, we remember the... The, 
the nurse being shot on her way home driving or the, the CEO uptown, but out there's, you know, there's dozens of others that we just kind of forget about and, you know, makes you wonder what, you know, all these, these quote unquote new ideas that aren't really new at all to basically dealing with an old problem that's, again, become yeah, the fire yeah. in the kitchen, as Mark called it. So the question is, is 108 the new normal? Or yeah. is 50? Uh, my guess is somewhere in between. Right. Uh, if I had to predict right now, we'll end up somewhere between there, maybe yeah. 80, 75. Still, uh, you know, way too many. But I I'm glad to see City Council finally jumping in and, 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 and looking at this. Yeah. But again, it really gets down to let's put out the fire first. Yeah. Right. And it would be a telltale sign to see if they can walk and chew gum at the yeah. same time. So <laughs> January, we're talking about That's how about I got this. my drive. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good, good. So January, they're talking about this. So right. we're going to see right. when we come back in March. Right. April April, May, June, yeah, to right. see if it's still a hot topic and you have done something about it or are we just doing it because we're starting the new year on the right foot? We'll give them credit for talking about it when the number's only one as opposed to, you know, after 108 homicides in 2019. By the way, amazing that there's a homicide day in court. Is it there? I mean, that yeah, kind of speaks once every to couple the problem, weeks, right? It's going to be, yeah. it used to be once a month and now it's once yeah. every two weeks. Um, kind of piggybacking on that topic, UNC Charlotte this week announced that uh, they are going to permanently remember the victims of last year's shooting on campus there um, in several different ways, both physical and um, with events and that sort of thing. And again, we always start with Eli on this story since you work in the building right next door to the building where these shootings took place. Talk about the, what's happening on campus and, and why. Yeah, so I work um, kind of catty corner to it across mm -hmm. a, a plaza. Um, I believe April 30th is going to be a day of remembrance. Um, the chancellor announced this week that there won't be uh, any classes that day. There will be a variety of events, both student and um, staff led, um, community led to remember the students who lost their lives and were wounded and were impacted in all kinds of ways, uh, whether or not they were there or uh, on campus, knew someone, you know, it's an event that really continues to reverberate. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also going to be a remembrance concert uh, that evening. I think tickets um, will be announced uh, next week, I think is what the chancellor said. And um, there will be a permanent memorial. They've uh, recommended that there be a request for proposals to uh, design this and um, really permanently remember um, the event and make sure that it's not something that's forgotten. Yeah, I, I, I saw that they were not going to use those two classrooms that were directly involved as classroom space anymore, similar to what they did at Virginia Tech when they had the, uh, a shooting like this. Um, those are the kinds of, th I mean, no one's going to forget this on that campus. No one's ever going to forget what happened there, but um, to, to find a special way to remember those who were directly involved, um, uh, victims and, and the folks that were on campus and part of the community when it happened is important, I guess, to you know, kind of healing after something like this. It is, and there are still many students um, who will be on campus this year in the coming few years yeah. uh, who are directly involved, and after that, um, it will be yeah. something that people will continue to remember for a long time. One thing I saw from the report, they're going to tour some other areas, other places that have memorials to these sorts of events, which kind of speaks to the problem that, right. that you can literally have a tour of place after place after place that's memorialized these comparable shootings. I guess it kind of speaks to where we are today as a, as a community. Um, let's change gears a little bit and talk about affordable housing, one of our favorite uh, uh, subjects. Uh, uh, an affordable housing project uh, that's been around for years and been in the headlines for a lot of bad reasons got some good press this week. And uh, Ashley and uh, Eli both wrote about this. T tell us about what's happening at Brook Hill Village. Um, so Brook Hill Village has been around since the 1950s. It's, um, it's, it, it's not technically a subsidized development as far as affordability, but over the years it's become affordable just because it's older buildings, it's mm -hmm. fallen into quite, a, quite poor repair actually, um, and that's part of the issues that's come up with the property. A lot of residents have said their buildings are just in terrible condition, but it is you know, renting at less than $500 per month in right. basically South End, which is just unheard of. <laughs> so um, as Eli has put it, it's, it's just this paradox um, um, between you know affordability versus the conditions in which they're living and um, the ownership structure has been super complicated the owner of the land has been the same since the 1950s but there's also a land lease agreement in place and um, there's just been some disagreement on how the property can be redeveloped mm -hmm. what the options are over the years um, so the the ownership of the buildings sold the land lease to um, a joint venture of a developer based in Zebulon which is in Wake County and um, uh, and they're working in partnership with a local nonprofit yeah. That oddball ownership 
one party owning the land and one party owning the buildings part of the problem that that's kind of prevented the the this disrepair from you know being corrected and maybe prevented this whole property from becoming something else like so much else has around it. Mm -hmm. Right, we're talking about 36 acres right at um, Tryon and Remount, kind mm -hmm. of right where there's been just this huge surge of development. Mm -hmm. uh, across the street there's new luxury apartments under construction. You can see uptown skyline from Brook Hill Village. <laughs> um, you know, there's a climbing gym there, there's new uh, arcade and craft beer bars, there's townhouses starting in the 400 thousands, mm -hmm. and... Wow. Apartment building just sold for mm -hmm. $100 million less than two blocks away. <laughs> and just wow. for context. Yeah, and Brook Hill Village is, uh, a large majority of the structures are in, in visible disrepair. Um, I've covered this story for a few years. Tenants I've talked to say that the conditions in there are, are not good. Um, and crime. And many of them are empty. And crime forced the U.S. Attorney's Office to get involved one, at mm -hmm. one point and seize the right. seize the well, property. Well, the U.S. Or, Attorney's yeah. Office, starting in 2016, um, initiated proceedings mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. seize this as sort of a chronic nuisance right. property. Mm -hmm. um, but now the new plans um, call for redeveloping part of the site with 324 um, apartments, about half of them reserved for people of low income, mm -hmm. half of them market rate. Mm -hmm. That would leave about 20 acres to redevelop for other commercial uses. Um, and what's different about this is a lot of the units um, would be reserved for people making 60% of the area median income or 30% of the area median, median income. Mm -hmm. And that's about almost $23,000 yeah. for a family of four. And that's where we have the biggest need right. as a community and that's where it's the hardest to develop. That's the rock, you know, the rock mm -hmm. bottom, one step above public housing, the folks that really can't afford almost anything in town, let alone something in this particular area close to uptown in the mm -hmm. center city, that sort of thing. So. Yeah, and I spoke to the developer yesterday, actually, and, and just kind of got some perspective. And he said the re a big reason why this deal was able to come together was not only getting the, um, you know, the ground lease and everything situated, but um, he could not use traditional tax credits to build that affordable housing, which, mm -hmm. you know, is a very integral part of building affordable housing. Um, but Freddie Mac recently introduced this new financing that um, of either nonprofits or or people who are doing af affordable or workforce housing can use, um, and it provides more flexible terms and things of that nature. So um, the idea is that they're going to use that funding to, to build a new affordable housing, as well as look for the housing trust fund and dollars and things of that nature. But he said there's still going to be about a $15 million funding shortfall hmm. to build the new units. So yeah. he's tasked with trying to find, you know, how to how to bridge that gap, how to get that $15 million to, to build these new units. So he's going to need community support. And I guess it is a step in the right direction. But two things, I wish more of those units would have go to the people who are making a 30% AMI. Because right. we're only talking about 62 units mm -hmm. that we're going to go for the people who really need affordable housing yeah. right now. And one thing I do like about it is that they did say that people who do live there, yeah. that they will have top priority right. after it's all finished yeah. and mm -hmm. looks good. They will have top priority to go back in there where other deals have gone through mm -hmm. where they weren't able and to go it's, back. And, I, and I, the previous owner of the building said that there were 145 um, occupied units as of the sale. And um, there's more than 400, I believe, units total on the property, but most of them are unoccupied. Mm. But um, if you think about it, that's a 445 families right. or individuals that, you know, we, we don't know where, if they're going to stay in place or, or what. But the idea is that they don't relocate them off-site while they do Right, and with 160 or so low-income units and 145 displaced people, do the math and hopefully those folks would all, if they choose to stay there, can and hopefully will stay there. If the AMI and, levels And be up, able to right. afford to yeah, stay yeah, there. It's going to be very right. competitive right. if you have 145 yeah. who are at the 30% AMI right. and only 62 yeah. units are available for them. Exactly. You know, it's going to be very um, stressful. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, other quick question. Any idea what the what the um, the other development on the site will be beyond the apartments? They've got plenty of acreage to do something there. I mean, will it... Uh, can I uh, bet on a brewery? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just um, saying. Yeah. Well, Tom Hendrickson, the developer, told me yesterday, I asked him about that. He said, you know, at this point, we are still just really focused on the residential, but the idea, the whole idea for the property, he says, is to, <coughs> is to truly be an homage and, you know, pay pay respect to Brook Hill right. and try to provide, um, you know, services and supportive complementary uses. Um, that can include health care, retail, mm -hmm. um, maybe some restaurants. A um, grocery it would, store? <laughs> it, maybe. I mean, it, yeah. if that would work out. Um, Wayne's. But, 
But yeah, he definitely said something that's complimentary, something that the, hopefully the residents there would be able to use. Right. And it's uh, right off the interstate. I mean, access, yeah. I mean, you talk mm -hmm. about. And South End. And, and the light, right. the light the, rail. The, the South yeah. Tryon and mm -hmm. South Boulevard, and, you know, Remount Road right off of 77. It, it, you know, yeah. you'll be prime for a lot of that stuff. Again, yeah. remarkable to spend the donut hole with all that other development around right. it that's, you know, that's remained as it is. Not necessarily in a, a good thing, but long term, it might be a good thing for the folks who are there now and provide some badly needed uh, affordable housing in an area that also badly needs right. it. Right. So, yeah. and, um, and Ray McKinnon, who's the pastor at South Tryon Community mm -hmm. uh, United Methodist Church, he's been working on this for a while. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he made a point there's really no other sites in South End, given the price of land, right. where you might see any development comparable to this. Yeah, right. step in the right direction. Um, David Tepper made a step in an interesting direction this week. <laughs> Chose a new coach, right? <laughs> went outside the, outside the box. A lot of folks praising it or criticizing it as a bold move, but he reached into the college ranks to pick the next coach to replace the coach he fired, Ron Rivera. Um, any thoughts about uh, what this says about Tepper as a team owner and a leader? And uh, how did and, he uh, make his money? How did he make his billions? <laughs> Buy low, sell high. I mean, he's, right. he's a guy who is, you know, made billions by thinking outside the box, taking risks, and you know, wise risks in most cases because he's he's certainly ahead of the game. So not surprising. I mean, I was surprised that he went the college route, but he stepped back and he went, well, maybe this is how. This is how, how he, he thinks. And I guess, keep in mind, I guess the new coach, he does have some NFL experience, not as a coach, but, you know, One he year. did, um, you know, on the <laughs> New York Giants. And that could yeah. be enough. Yeah. So, yeah. so, I mean, you know, no risk, no yeah. reward. I mean, um, I mean, not only did the Panthers need a good coach, but it needs a good person who is a build bridger, yeah. who can bring a team together. And you needed yeah. somebody on the, who has yeah. a resume who can say, I can take um, a bad situation mm -hmm. and I can turn, a, you know, a team who, who, who has lost 11 games, and I can turn that around yeah. to the you team had to who go could there, win 11 <laughs> games. So, you know, so, I mean, you know, yeah. we, we just have to see. New coach's name is Matt Rule. He comes from Baylor University. All He's jokes, known as a turnaround guy. He turned he around bad programs at uh, <laughs> Rule Rule. University <laughs> and also uh, at Baylor. Uh, they're going to pay him, uh, it's a seven-year contract worth between 60 and $70 million total. And, and he's getting, Tepper, by the way, getting some criticism from other owners now about overpaying. They're, what, what they're essentially saying is you paid too much and you gave him too much contract, too long of a contract for a guy with no experience. You've kind of upped the ante for the rest of us, increased the price of pork as one um, NFL insider called it, and uh, you know, got, but he is the richest owner in the NFL. So I his guess his team, his, his money, prerogative, yeah. his decision, yeah, yeah. And his yeah. prerogative. You but, know what I mean? So yeah. that I mean, that shows that if you're going to give somebody a seven-year contract, that means a that I believe in you. Mm -hmm. I believe that you're going to turn the team around and then add bonuses in there yeah. as well. So I mean, I mean, it's the price of doing business. Yeah, I hope know? it doesn't mean it's going to take seven years to turn the team. <laughs> That's my fear. I don't it's think a, he's it's a seven-year program. Yeah, you know? right. I don't think he's that patient. But <laughs> no. I'm pretty Did, sure there's some outs. He's yeah. got the money to buy him out. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, he also spent six million on a buyout from Baylor to get this guy. Oh so that's that's in addition well, to the contract that he's paying to coach himself. Yeah. The thinking there is that that rule had some connection to the New York Giants. That's where he had been temporarily mm -hmm. a coach, and that they were going to offer him a deal. Mm -hmm. And basically, Tepper went in and said, "I don't want you to go to. What would it take to get you to do the deal right now? Just like a car dealer right. does, right? Well, I want before you go across the street. I want." I want to yeah, talk to my manager. Isn't the story that he flew <laughs> yeah. to Baylor and waited for the rule and his family to come back from, from vacation? vacation yeah. right. He's like, hey, can we talk? <laughs> but but uh, other NFL teams yeah. wanted him right. as right. well. So, yeah. um, so he was a hot yeah. commodity. Exactly. The New York Giants, very When, the, when the billionaire shows up on your doorstep, you probably find time for him to listen to well, him. Anyway, we'll see. The other thing is, really of course, his team. <laughs> yeah. I feel like uh, this is yeah. Tepper's yeah. team. Before, right. he still had so much yeah. legacy personnel, so many other. Now it's really it's his to house. own. Yeah. Yeah. And did anybody see the, the news conference? Preach it. Preach <laughs> it. And yeah, find out his father is a minister. But yeah. I mean, it was preaching. Now, yeah. at Baylor, he 
coached on Saturday and probably went to church and maybe preached on Sunday. Well, we need a lot Can't of prayer. Can't do it both. The Panthers yeah, need a lot of prayer. <laughs> he's going to have a he's going to have a full cathedral on Sunday it was, afternoon. It was pretty <laughs> impressive. I mean, it was. It was, it was yeah. He it came was out the gate roaring. You know yeah. what I mean? So, um, so hey, so you know, more power yeah. to him. Yeah. We want a winning team. Yeah. We got two other two minutes and two other quick stories to talk about. The uh, on time record of uh, Douglas Airport, um, top five among all major airports in the world, uh, which. Is, is that a good thing. Luggage? Uh, they were number 14 <laughs> right, exactly. last year. I guess yeah. uh, an efficient, well-run, um, on-time airport is a good thing for not just travelers but business too. Well, it's interesting because you mentioned earlier, um, if you look at the percentage year over year, it's not that much of a difference. Mm -hmm. I think it was 79.9% last year. Right, 80.7 this year. It's a little year, bit yeah. higher. Mm -hmm. So it's like a half a percent higher than last year. But um, yeah, I think it's a relativity thing. Um, Perhaps other airports simply just had a poor, you know, arrival and, and, and departure time. Um, but you know, I mean, number five. I mean, it's it sounds great, and uh, you know, hopefully they yeah. can keep it up. But if you look at the past few years, the range has typically been between seventy-eight and eighty-one yeah. percent. And with all the money that the city is pouring yeah, into the airport, right. you would want they should be number one. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's going to be the biggest thing for yeah. passengers going forward. Now right. they've closed two of the four entry and exit right. doors. There's mm -hmm. going to be a lot more construction in the terminal lobby. So aside yeah. from yeah. On time, that's going to be the main thing. On time, leaving or right. arriving, yeah. great. Just good luck getting to the airport and in the gonna first place. it's going to be it's five and a half, six year projects. Yeah, so. yeah. exactly. Yeah. But that headline is good because a lot of businesses, right. I told, move right. here yeah. Yeah. because the of yes. hey, the airport. airport is our golden. Goose. Except the yeah. baggage. Absolutely. I've heard there have been some complaints yeah. with yeah, I mean, retrieving your baggage wait. after you land. Hey, real quick, uh, the, the scooters in town. The city's proposing corrals, parking areas, so that instead of parking anywhere on the sidewalk or you know, places where people can trip over it, they'll all go in the same kind of parking lots. Any thoughts on whether this has any chance at all of being effective? What's the fine for not doing that? No. Uh, really? You gotta change the behavior. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm, I mean, it, it, I hope it theory, works. Right? Yeah, in theory, it, it should work. It could work. It would solve a problem. We'll yeah. see. We'll see. Yeah, we'll to take a vote. Will it work? <laughs> <laughs> and there we are. Okay, uh, folks. Yeah. By the way, question of the week. I almost forgot. Um, David Tepper, do you approve or disapprove of all the changes he's made with the team? 53% say yes, we approve of David Tepper's plans and changes. And 47% uh, say uh, they do not approve. Those numbers on the screen are wrong. It's uh -oh. 53 and 47. Yes, no. Anyway. Um, that's all know. the time we have. And uh, you voted at home. We just voted here on the scooters <laughs> and uh, gives us more to talk about next week. Hey, thanks for coming back for a new year. Thank you for joining us for a new year as well. Join us anytime online at uh, off the record at WTVI.org. We'll see you next week on Off the Record. Production of PBS Charlotte.